All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 41, the black, the white, and the red connections between ancient alchemy and the geology utilized in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. So in today's episode, I will be discussing the connections between an ancient alchemical process known as the great work and the geology utilized in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids, specifically black basalt, white limestone, and red granite. So I will also begin to integrate the information presented in the previous episode regarding the geolocation of the ancient structures across the planet with the results of the electromagnetic field experiment, which I revealed in episode 33. So if you haven't seen either of those two episodes, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell so that you get noticed when the new videos drop every week and go back and check out all 40 episodes here on the channel that have brought us up to this point. So the information that I'm going to be discussing today, these are some of my favorite revelations from my first trip to Egypt back in 2017, which inevitably led to the development of my theory that I present here on the channel and also in my book that the Egyptian pyramids were designed to produce chemicals on an industrial scale. So I am super excited to finally reveal some of the foundations of my research here on this channel. So thank you so much to all of the subscribers. Your encouragement and positivity mean the world to me. If you want to help support the channel, just go to www.thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a copy of the book, grab yourself a t-shirt. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. So today we will be discussing black basalt, white limestone, and red granite as related to the three stages of an ancient alchemical process, the magnum opus, and those three stages are known as the negredo, the albedo, and the rubedo. So when I first started researching connections between ancient alchemy, or really chemistry, and the Egyptian pyramids, I couldn't help but immediately notice that the three colors of the prominent geology featured in the Egyptian pyramids, black basalt, white limestone, and red granite, are all featured on the modern Egyptian flag. These three colors are, of course, conventionally explained as related to the modern Egyptian revolution, and these are the same colors displayed on many flags of countries in the Middle East. However, this quote-unquote coincidence definitely caught my attention, especially when I began to investigate the potential functionality of these three types of stone as related to the operation of the Egyptian pyramids. So next up, this is a depiction of the magnum opus, or the great work and you have three different stages of this alchemical process. Here on the left, this is known as the negredo, or the black stage. Here in the center, this is known as the albedo, or the white stage. And here on the right, this is the rubedo, or the red and final stage. So these three stages of the alchemical process, I believe, encode an alchemical extraction for the production of highly pure gold metal. So most minerals, even normal rocks, for example, contain minute amounts of gold. And by a process of chemical extraction, you can retrieve pure gold metal. So this is exactly what is meant by the mythology of the quote unquote philosopher's stone, etc., that anything can be transformed using this magical stone into gold. Well, it's not an actual stone at all. It refers to the knowledge of chemistry and by which you can literally transform ordinary matter into gold. And this is exactly how you should read these alchemical texts. Remember that if you lift the veil of the spiritual alchemy of the soul nonsense narrative, you will find practical scientific chemistry. So through these three stages, the negredo or the calcination or burning stage to remove superfluous matter, the center stage, the albedo, which is washing and purification in acids, which relate directly to the function of the great and central pyramids, which were producing sulfuric and hydrochloric acids respectively, and I have discussed extensively here on the channel, so please subscribe, go back and watch all of those amazing episodes. And finally, the rubedo, the red stage, signaling completion of the great work and production of a colloidal gold suspension 
containing gold nanoparticles, which is a red solution that you can see here in this image from Flynn Science. So this here, this is a colloidal gold suspension containing nanoparticles of gold that are dispersing the light from the laser beam that you can see here being shined through this suspension. So this suspension can then be evaporated to retrieve the super pure gold and then smelt it into gold metal. And we can see evidence of highly pure gold across the ancient world, which could not have been produced by smelting directly from ore without this chemical extraction process. So we know that gold particles were in fact being produced in the ancient world, as you can see here in the Lycurgus cup. And it is due to the gold nanoparticles suspended in the glass that caused this red illumination. So once again, glass making being another huge application for chemistry in the ancient world and direct evidence of the use of acids prior to the conventional historic data. Remember, this is supposed to be a Roman cup, and we don't hear anything about them using chemicals either, but you couldn't make this cup without the use of acids. It is literally impossible to make gold nanoparticles without aqua regia, which is both nitric and hydrochloric acids combined. Hydrochloric acid, of course, being produced in the central pyramid of Giza, and nitric acid, which I haven't covered yet here on the channel, so just stay tuned. And next up, we can see the white and red stages represented in the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, which I think could have been symbolic of the chemical practices and the products being produced in these two separate regions. And after the reunification period, these two crowns were combined into one, which you can see here in the bottom left corner. So we also see in ancient Egypt a blue crown, which I believe could have also been associated with Egyptian blue, which is by historical record, the first synthetic compound ever being produced. And this compound is known as cal calcium copper silicate, which was being produced on a massive industrial scale in Egypt during the dynastic period. This is another seldom mentioned connection between ancient Egypt and chemistry that I uncovered as I started researching this subject. All right, everyone, if you want to help support the Land of Chem project, just a quick reminder that brand new Land of Chem t-shirts are now on my website, www.thelandofchem.com. I am currently wearing the new black print on the gray shirt. I absolutely love these new fifth degree logos, the alchemical symbol for hydrochloric acid on a raw image of the central pyramid of Giza. These shirts are absolutely fantastic, incredibly comfortable. The prints are amazing. I can't say enough good things. Adam, thank you so much for helping me with this new logo design. And don't forget about the OG second degree logo, a symbol representing the red pyramid of Dashur with molecular ammonia inside of the structure. This logo designed by yours truly. Both of these shirts now available at www.thelandofchem.com. And of course, limited first edition print copies of the Land of Chem book and initiation into the Egyptian pyramids is also available at www.thelandofchem.com. So if you want to help support me and support this project, just go to the website, pick up a copy of the book, grab yourself a t-shirt. Either way, all of these orders mean more to me than words can possibly ever describe. So I will simply say, thank you so much. And finally, the black, the white, and the red, reflected in all of the ancient sites across Egypt. And again, this was one of the first blatantly obvious connections that dawned on me between the colors of these three types of stone, black basalt, white limestone, and red granite, being represented in the Egyptian flag, and symbolically displayed in the three stages of the great work, the Negredo, the Albedo, and the Rubedo of the medieval alchemists. So I have been researching ancient alchemy for almost a decade, way before I started looking at the Egyptian pyramids. And as soon as I started to realize these connections during my first trip back in 2017, I immediately knew that I was looking at structures that were related to the science of chemistry. So you can see here, black basalt from the Egyptian museum and the black basalt utilized in the construction at Abu Sir, which at this site is mostly utilized for flooring and casing stones. So next up, we can see some white limestone, again, the Egyptian museum, and some of the white limestone found on the Giza Plateau, which is here in the casing stones of the Great Pyramid. And last but not least, red granite, 
which you can see here again from the case in the Egyptian Museum and here on the right an absolutely badass photo looking into the northern air shaft in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. So now for those of you who have not seen it yet, I'm going to insert a short clip of the experiment that previews the properties of these three types of stone in proximity to an electromagnetic energy field. Now keep in mind that the geology utilized in these structures was strategically placed on the globe in locations where there are convergences of the Earth's electromagnetic grid system. So the properties of these three types of stone that you will see in this video are integrated into the function of these structures. However, each type of stone also has very unique and unusual properties in addition to the electromagnetic interface that I will be getting to in a later video, so just stay tuned. Now, without further ado, a demonstration of the properties of black basalt, the white limestone, and the red granite. The black, the white, and the red, the colors of ancient Egypt, the colors of ancient alchemy, and the colors of modern Egypt interacting with the Earth's electromagnetic grid field. Hope you enjoy. So they can charge, build up the energy field from it. And um, everyone who visits the sites is familiar with the combination of stones, which is of course the limestone, basalt stone, white calcite crystal or alabaster, and the rose grain. Every pyramid almost have at least three out of the four of these elements. And now we will see how some of them releases the charge that builds up and some of them don't. So all right, so this this first one that we have here, let me circle around so we can get a little closer here. Yeah. All right, so here is your sample of black basalt. This is the calcite. This is red granite here, and this is limestone. So a quick note about the chemical composition of these things. So limestone is predominantly calcium carbonate. This is going to be a mixture of things, mostly including quartz. This also has a high quartz content, and I have to get back to you on the specific content of the um, black basalt. basalt. Yeah. We can here see... Of course, the core of the structure of any pyramid structure is usually limestone. The inner courses of any pyramid is limestone and also the wall beneath the wall. So like there is a wall of limestone in every pyramid structure and uh, this wall is surrounded on both sides with granite in most cases. Sometime, uh, sometimes it will be basalt, sometimes it will be another type of limestone. And even in the Great Pyramid, for example, the Eastern Temple of the Great Pyramid, we all know that that floor is made of the black basalt. The King's Chamber and the Antechamber of the Great Pyramid are made of the red granite. This white calcite is found all throughout the sites in Egypt, predominantly used in the floor of structures, but you also see it utilized in some other applications. And then, of course, the limestone is ubiquitous throughout all of the Egyptian pyramids and all of the structures here in Egypt. And, and the first one we're going to test here is that limestone sample. And you can clearly hear the discharge being produced. And if I can zoom in close enough, you may even be able to see the... There you go. And once we get through testing a few of these samples, I'm going to provide some commentary as to why these pieces of stone are doing what they are doing. So again, all of these geological samples are in proximity of that electromagnetic field being produced by this machine. And here we have the basalt stone. And you guys can see that that electromagnetic energy is passing through the stone and producing a discharge onto that little copper wire. And even if I stick my finger on this thing, 
Yep. <laughs> it, it gets me every time. It, it'll produce a discharge directly into your body. And you can hear that every time. Same thing with the limestone. <laughs> but then when we come to white color side, nothing. Still, you can feel the vibration Correct. Of, of the charge in the stone, but it doesn't release it. So again, it holds this, it inside. This material has high quartz content, as does the red granite here. And you can't hear any noise, and there is no discharge being produced between the stone and the copper wire. But again, if you just put your hands around this, it's very similar to touching the machine itself. You can feel that electromagnetic current resonating from the stone. So both white, white calcite and granite stone somehow uh, create impedance of the... Correct. So the, lime, the limestone here, calcium carbonate, when I originally started researching this, I thought that the limestone would produce no discharge because there's nothing to carry that electromagnetic flow through the stone itself. Hmm. However, it's the exact opposite. What we're looking at here is a demonstration of electromagnetic impedance. And so this limestone doesn't have any metal. It doesn't have any quartz. Again, it is calcium carbonate. So there is nothing that prevents the electromagnetic energy from flowing through the stone into the copper wire. So again, the, the magnetic current flow moves directly through the stone into the wire, producing that discharge. And you'll see the same thing here with the black basalt. Again, there is no electromagnetic impedance that is preventing that current from passing through this stone. And just remember that the body of all of these pyramids are constructed from that limestone. Again, one more shot here of the calcite. And the reason that I believe that this is happening with the calcite and the granite, again, I thought that would produce the biggest discharge. However, these stones with the high quartz content and the high metal content in the red granite are capturing that electromagnetic energy that is building up in the machine and trapping it inside of the stone. Again, that electromagnetic impedance. So you can feel the energy vibrating through this stone and it's holding on and trapping all of that electromagnetic energy inside of the red granite, inside of the crystal and the white calcite. And these other two types of stone just allow it to pass directly through without capturing it inside of the stone. And I won't say at this point why I think that is the case or what the effect was that it was producing inside of the structures, but this is just a demonstration of the properties of these stones in proximity to this electromagnetic field. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 41, the black, the white, and the red, connections between ancient alchemy and the geology of the Egyptian pyramid. So in today's episode, I mentioned metallurgy as being one of the uses for the acids being produced on the Giza Plateau. So in the next several episodes, I'm gonna do a series explaining exactly how all of the chemicals being produced inside of the Egyptian pyramids were actually being used by this ancient civilization. So the methane gas, from the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara, the ammonia from the Red Pyramid, the ammonium bicarbonate from the Bent Pyramid of Dashur, and of course, the sulfuric and hydrochloric acids from the Great and Central Pyramids of Giza. Thank you all so much for your support. If you haven't already, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube. If you want to help support the channel, www.thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a copy of the book, grab yourself a t-shirt. Either way, all of the orders mean the world to me. Thank you all so much for your positivity and encouragement. I think that is it for today's video. So I will see you next time.